Welcome to Tax Conversations. It's uh, my pleasure today to host uh, Professor Tom Hole, Iowa State uh, University. He is the moral professor of chemistry. Uh, Tom is on the editorial advisory board of JAX and is the editor in chief of the ACS Journal of Chemical Education. Uh, welcome, Tom. Um, I'm Thank glad you. to be able to host this conversation with you uh, today. Let me start off with a few questions. Um, some are going to be general, some are going to be a bit more personal. And uh, we'll end up with some questions um, about JAX and your new role as um, editorial advisory board member. I can tap into some suggestions you may have um, for improving uh, the journal. Um, let me just start off with the question of what is your vision for the field of chemistry? Oh, thank you for, for having me uh, join you for this conversation. I'm, I'm excited to have this chance to chat with you. Uh, for the vision of chemistry for me, I think is that it's always been the central science. I, I, I really believe that. I've always found that my work and my studies with respect to chemistry allow me to connect in so many ways. Um, and so to me, that's still the vision. We still need to find the best way to help others um, see that chemistry is the central science. And I think to a large degree, that um, that's, requires us to think a little bit more about what I call systems thinking, um, and maybe systems engineers don't, but uh, the, the idea of these large complex problems that we have and need to solve, I think chemists are gonna be at the center of the teams that solve most of the problems and most of the things of interest to humankind at this point in time. So um, what are some of those problems, I'm curious, um, that will mm -hmm. keep us relevant to the future? We could think of it in, in kind of the usual terms that, uh, you know, we need energy, we need food, we need water, and all of those things um, are put under stress by the, the size of the population in the planet and by our growth and, and by other factors. The UN Sustainable Development Goals are quite interesting. I, they're, they're, you know, designed to be a, a chunk in time, and that helps us um, think in terms of what we can do in the intermediate future. Uh, but the one that I really like is called the Planetary Boundaries Framework. It comes out of the Stockholm Resilience Center. The idea that um, we can begin to enumerate uh, control variables, that if we get too far, um, we can recognize the challenges and the problems that we may have kind of compounding. Um, so things like biogeochemical flows of nitrogen and phosphorus, for example, clearly in order to be able to address those concerns while at the same time feeding the planet um, represents something that cannot be done without chemists. And so those are really interesting questions, both for researchers and chemistry educators and framework within which to, to couch those kinds of concerns and, and, and desires to contribute to the earth and human society. So why do you think it's so difficult for the general public to appreciate um, what we can bring as chemists uh, to a, solving these complex problems? I think to a certain extent, one of the things that happens for us as chemists, and we have models that we've developed through our, our professional expertise that allow us to address those um, at any scale, and, and most people don't. Um, and so they tend to find models that are, are maybe um, almost just kind of catchphrases as opposed to models, right? So that the idea of of chemical free apples, right? When you see that at the um, at the farmer's market, works pretty well for people who are trying to concentrate on what can I have as healthy food? It's reasonable to want healthy food. Um, and so what we need is to find good ways to, to have models that, um, that the general public can use um, to, to understand these complex problems. So you're a physical chemist, but you're special in that, um, or I should say, and you're special. In that, yeah, you're also interested in chemical education and have obviously given that some deep thought. Um, so what could we do better in terms of educating future chemists? And I guess that also involves those that are in the classroom that aren't going to choose a career in chemistry. I think the biggest challenge really is to, to rebalance what we, what we believe needs to be accomplished, particularly at the kind of introductory levels where we're seeing many more people that are, are for example, not going to be chemists. We have a, a long-standing propensity towards um, getting to the foundations and trying to help students really be able to think about the chemistry at a foundational level. But that has a tendency to 
make us a bit on the reductionist side and when we start teaching about chemistry we we look at a big problem and very quickly reduce it to that smallest model that you and i as chemists use um, but we don't go back out we, we kind of zoom in but we don't help the students zoom back out as much as i think we need to do how do we take what we're always teaching and help students see the connections my colleague vicente talancur at university of arizona has has worked in that respect and, and melanie cooper and her group have worked with this chemistry life the universe and everything all of these ideas of of coming around to how do we how do we get the big picture and the details um in a, in a little bit adjusted balance more towards a little bit more towards the big than we've been for a while in the curriculum i mean i always find that it, it astounds me that we still teach chemistry so compartmentalized even the chemistry students often fail to see the connection initially, right? That uh, the particle in a box applies to why carrots are, are orange, right? <laughs> yes, that's, and, and, and you know, that's the thing that, that makes being a chemist so much fun is that you and I can see that and think that and understand that. And it's why it's such a joy when we do have our students get there, right? That's, that's really fun. And it's fun for them too. Um, and so uh, to me, that's the, that, that over compartmentalization really is, is an issue. And the more we can find the connections, uh, the better. So what's your advice for the next generation of chemists? I, I think we're at a point in time where incorporating the concepts of sustainability are probably important to do. The future chemists are almost certainly going to have to. Um, you know, they're, they're going to be confronted with issues that um, of sustaining life on the planet that we haven't had to confront. We haven't been able yet to um, marshal the resources, both scientific and, and political and societal, um, to, I guess that's not both, that is three things <laughs> um, that, uh, that we really need to, um, to, to help students see that they can do those things. I, I think many of the students that I encounter um, in, in general chemistry these days really want to try to do those things and they have to find out how to ways to envision that that could happen. Um, so those to me are the things that I would recommend um, students find a way to, to, to learn the core, get good at the core. Absolutely. We need chemists who know chemistry to be able to be part of these big multidisciplinary teams that we're going to need. But look for the place where you want to be on those teams. Um, and that's uh, that's going to help you figure out what areas, what things, what ideas you need to be good at. I'm always uh, advising my students in the context of collaborations. You know, it's great. So we're synthetic chemists. We can make molecules, but um, embrace a new area so that you're not only providing a service and as part of that co collaboration, but you have intellectual input as to how that research, which I think is what you're suggesting to think about the totality um, of the problem. Absolutely. And I, I agree that that's I really think that in many cases, the solutions are going to be first envisioned by the chemist in the group. Your observation is really good with respect to that. We really do need to encourage them that it's um, collaboration is where we can is amazing because it's the place where we can stretch our way of doing things as chemists um, to, to help other things. I'm curious um, if you could share with us your experiences as a young faculty and in, in, in your opinion, what what resulted in your great success as an academic? In terms of the young, when I was a young faculty, I was really trying to struggle. You've noted that I have this kind of foot in two territories with physical chemistry and chemistry education. Um, and, and I've long had an interest in doing that. When I started out at a, a University of South Dakota, which was a, a smaller department, but really at the time I was there, strongly focused, I think still is, strongly focused on, on working with undergraduates for research. And that it really honed my thinking about how do I how do I merge these things? Because undergraduate research is a great way to merge teaching and research. The leader of my department at that time, Roy Sangstrom, was a leader in the Council on Undergraduate Research and, and really knew how to how to get things going and keeping them going and getting it all to work. That was a, a big break for me to have that opportunity. Um, and at the same time, I was I was allowed to explore in the classroom somewhat safely um, new ideas about teaching. Right? Often, I think young faculty are nervous to do something unusual or different with teaching because 
um, you just don't want to have students up in arms because you're trying something that maybe doesn't work as well as it should. So I, I was fortunate that I had um, had colleagues who helped me to make sure that I was I was keeping tabs of where the students were as I tried to do these things with my teaching. Um, and so that that again being in that department where we had the the really strong interest in and energy towards both research and teaching that really, I think, made a big difference for me. Who are your mentors or heroes? Yeah, so the teaching and, and research mentors are, are, are really important. So um, my thesis advisor was John Hutchinson at Rice University, and John's a brilliant teacher, and, and we had really, uh, really interesting and, and, and fun things to do in terms of our research at that time. My postdoc advisor, at Rafi Levine, at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, was, uh, was really um, just amazing at, at, you know, we would get a surprising research result, and, and just to be in the room and watch him think through what did it mean and how do we go, where do we go next? How do we keep moving? Um, was a, a tremendous thing for me to have an opportunity to do. So he was, he was great at that. Roy Sangstrom, I've mentioned, is another uh, great mentor. Um, in terms of heroes, I, I really have to say it's terrible, but my colleague in the chemistry department here, Klaus Rudenberg, um, is just amazing. He's, he's got the best physical intuition of what chemical bonding is in the world. And he's still here. He's still working. He's at the office. Um, most of the time he's coming to seminars and he's 100 years old um, and he's still contributing to the field. It's just astounding. So that's a hero that I want to emulate. I'd love to be able to do that. Um, so I know it's rare, but um, he's, a, he's, a, he's a hero to me. What do you consider some of your biggest accomplishments? I've tried throughout my whole career. My, my goal has always been um, to, to improve my measurements of what's going on in the class, that is assessing with better data so that I have a better feel for whether or not the things I'm trying are working. Um, I think that's a, an approach to me that has been very fruitful. It means that um, every now and then I find out it's not working and I have to change things, which isn't fun, but um, but I think it's worth worth the effort. And so to me, I think that's a, an accomplishment that I've, I've embraced um, looking at the data, even in the big classes and trying to do better um, as, a, as a pretty important one. Um, and, and, you know, I, I absolutely am thrilled when, you know, you go through hooding and you have your students finish and you have the, you get to watch them turn into these amazing scientists. There's, there's no question that's a, I'm very proud of those students and what they've accomplished. So you mentioned data and, and I guess these days big data. To me, the idea of balance comes in in so many ways. And that's, that's one of the places I think balance really needs to be addressed, right? It's great to be able to access big data and to analyze big data and to visualize big data. But um, it's important to remember that we still have to ask the questions from the perspective of what's the important science, what's the important chemistry, what's the molecule that we need to fill this gap that we're missing, um, or how do, we, how do we make a series of molecules or materials that'll do that for us. Um, and, and that kind of intuition can be informed by the data, but I think you have to, you still have to fall back on that intuition, which we hopefully have helped you develop um, in terms of these bigger picture um, applications of the smaller core chemistry ideas. I guess I'm reminded of that um, adage, I guess, um, uh, information, or I guess as a euphemism for data um, is not knowledge, right? Um, right. Data itself is not knowledge, is, is what we teach. Uh, students, the, the analysis, asking the right questions, as you mentioned, that then ultimately turns it into uh, actionable knowledge. Right? Since uh, you're now an, a member of the editorial advisory board of the Journal of the American Chemical Society, I'd like to pick your brain on a few things with respect sure. to JAX. Um, if you had to suggest to a student a JAX paper to read, which one would that be? All right. So given what I've been talking about so far, you're probably going to be entirely unsurprised about this. But there was a perspective by Ola and what Prakash and Geppert um, on kind of the anthropogenic um, carbon cycle um, that was to me just exactly what I like my students to think about when they're worrying about chemical problems, right? How do we look at this little, this kind of single component and say, where does that fit in this other thing? And then where do those components connect to fit into these other things? Um, and it's, um, to me, uh, just a, a wonderful perspective, I think. It's, I like perspectives very often. I love to look at things that I'm kind of far away from what I do. So then the perspectives do a, a nice job of 
of helping me kind of get a, a broader feel for what's going on in other areas of science I don't necessarily have time to keep up with on a regular basis. That's on the to read list every time a student comes into the office. It's, that one, I like that one a lot. That's good to hear. Yeah, perspectives are very popular. And I use them just as you have described to stay mm -hmm. abreast of new developments in, in areas that are slightly outside of my um, area of expertise. So right. what, what has Jack's done, better, done well, in your opinion, and what could it do better moving into the future? I firmly believe that when I look at a paper in Jack's, it's going to be a pretty high quality science piece of work. And the job it's been doing for years is brilliant at, at making sure that we have um, done a pretty good job of, of highlighting really, really high quality chemistry um, across all of the chemical enterprise. Where that might cause a little bit of trouble is I do think there's a there's maybe a bit of a feedback loop that um, that once once you've kind of made it to the point where you're getting um, good at the, your science and are capable of sending things in and, and finding the peer review process friendly enough at, at JAX that you there it might be a little bit harder for the newer people to get involved. We need to hear from people who are doing good work for a long time. Um, but hopefully that doesn't discourage those who are just getting started too. Do you have any words you want to share with us? Um, perhaps questions that I've missed out on or comments that you want to add? Um... I am actually quite grateful to have had the opportunity for this conversation and to be able to serve on the editorial advisory board. Right? The, the, I, I'm a big believer that the, the chemistry education um, plays such an important role in the chemical enterprise that, it, that it, it has a place in, in our professional publication. I'm curious to know whether there are, are things that we can do as a, as a community of educators um, to, to make things work well for uh, the future in terms of, of publishing chemistry education uh, ideas and research, database research that help others uh, think about what they can do maybe um, to help their students learn chemistry. I'm very interested in having that conversation, probably not in a in an interview circumstance, but uh, I'd be I'd be curious to um, to hold that conversation or hear your thoughts. Well, you've already uh, provided some great names for uh, authoring uh, perspectives in the future, and mm -hmm. certainly I should invite those individuals to interviews like this and to uh, presentations because that is a conversation that we need to have. I'm going to switch gears just a little bit for a moment. I notice mm -hmm. in your background a guitar, and and it seems to me that. Um, uh, scientists often have music as um, as a hobby. Um, so, how, what role does music play in your life? I think I got to be creative with music before I got to be creative with science. Um, that that was that was part of of the the process that I I, I came to enjoy um, the creative components of playing music and and jamming with um, other folks or. Um, we used to do a bit when I played in pubs in, in, in college where we would do essentially improv where we'd get a title and we'd sing a song um, in 10 seconds kind of thing. And um, that, that, was, that was great practice in some sense for looking for the creative outlet. And then, I, so I was doing that and then I got to do undergraduate research and all of a sudden science was creative too. Um, and I think for those of us fortunate enough to find those connections in both uh, both our kind of professional life and our leisure life. For me, guitar is now just a leisure life. I don't. Nobody pays to watch me <laughs> play guitar anymore. Um, that's a, that's a, a, a connection that I'm, I'm deeply grateful I was able to to make and have the time to do that. I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule and uh, sharing your thoughts uh, on a number of different topics. Yeah, thank you for uh, having me join you. This has been very interesting and very fun.